Hello students, welcome to EPG Parkshala. I am Dr. Jaspreet Kaur and today we will study the module Enculturation, Acculturation and Transculturation from the paper Social and Cultural Anthropology. Let us go through the learning objectives of this module. The first is to develop an understanding about the concept of enculturation, acculturation and transculturation and second is to different study the different factors that influence transculturation. Now Adamson Hobel says enculturation is both a conscious and an unconscious conditioning process where a man as child and as an adult achieves competence in his culture internalizes his culture and becomes thoroughly enculturated. Anthropologist Margaret Mead clearly defined enculturation in 1963 as a process distinct from socialization in that enculturation refers to the actual process of cultural learning with a specific culture. One internalizes the dreams and expectations, the rules and requirements, not just for the larger society seen as a whole, but also for every specific demand within the whole. Society does whatever is necessary to aid any one of its member in learning proper and appropriate behavior for any given social setting and in meeting the demands of any challenge. Enculturation begins before birth and continues until death. Thus, one learns respect for the symbols of the nation through reciting a pledge of alliance and singing the national anthem in schools. He learns with whom he may be physically violent and with whom he cannot be. He becomes aware of his rights and obligations and privileges as well as the rights of the others. Sociologists spoke of the birth of new generations of children as a recurrent barbarian invasion. One reason was that because human infants do not possess culture at birth. They have no conception of the world, no language or no morality. It is in this sense that Parsons uses the word barbarian in reference to infants. They are uncultured, unsocialized persons. All an infant needs to live and cope with the cultural context awaiting him is acquired through the process termed enculturation by the anthropologist and socialization by the sociologist. We may define enculturation as a process by which individuals acquire the knowledge, the skills, the attitudes and values that enable them to become functioning members of their societies. Awaiting the infant is a society possessing culture and ordered way of life. The child possesses certain possibilities for processing information and developing desires making it possible for that ordered way of life to influence him. These enduring competencies and standards of judgments along with attitudes and motives form the personality. The personality in turn influences the culture. Various anthropologists have tended to regard enculturation as consisting of such processes as socialization, the acquiring of culture and cultural internalization, excluding an innovative process of enculturation. Enculturation is the process whereby an established culture influences and teaches an individual, group, or organization to the extent that the target adopts the particular culture's values, norms, behaviors and that the target finds an accepted role within the established culture. The concept is distinct from acculturation, cultural adjustment and cultural adaptation. The individual process of enculturation also applies to enculturation within organizations. An awareness of the process of enculturation is important in effective intercultural trainings. The process of enculturation is not entirely passive or unconscious as the cultural transmission or transmutation 
involves processes of teaching and learning that are reflective, deliberate, incidental and functional. The term enculturation was first coined by cultural anthropologist Melville Herskovitz in 1948. Herskovitz's definition of enculturation includes a process of novel change and inquiry. Two phases of enculturation, according to Herskovitz, can be distinguished as the first is the unconscious stage of early years in human growth where the individual unconsciously internalizes his culture and the second is the conscious stage of later years which involves innovations initiated by individuals. Now it is proposed that enculturation be defined as a construct and a process in behavioral sense that delineates transmission and transmutation of culture throughout human growth. Cultural transmission is a process of acquiring the existing culture. Cultural transmutation, on the other hand, is a process of psychosocial mutation. Enculturation thus involves innovation and inquiry, which is a particular type of epistemological sensitivity to the culture. Conrad Philip Kotak, an American anthropologist, wrote a textbook called Window on Humanity, a concise introduction to anthropology, in which he has written, Enculturation is the process where the culture that is currently established teaches an individual the accepted norms and values of the culture or society where the individual lives. The individual can become an accepted member and fulfill the needed functions and roles of the group. Most importantly, the individual knows and establishes a context of boundaries and accepted behavior that dictates what is acceptable and not acceptable within the framework of that society. It teaches the individual their role within the society as well as what is accepted behavior within that society and lifestyle. Enculturation does not always come from deliberate learning but also by seeing and observing. As we observe our elders doing a particular thing, we do it too and sometimes without even thinking why we do a particular thing that way. There may be a reason behind it but as we learn, we don't necessarily reason our elders but just do things how they asked us to do them. This comes from having a sense of trust and respect for them that they definitely know more than us. So thus, enculturation means it is the adoption of behavior, the language, the morals and the values of a particular culture and then when that individual is accepted within that society and lifestyle. So let's look into the features of enculturation. It is a process in which the adoption of behavior patterns of the surrounding culture. It includes the socialization of the child. And then the child learns the norms of their culture. The process of learning to become a responsible adult member of the society. And culturation helps mold a person's personality. And it can be either conscious or unconscious. It is a lifelong process that helps the unity among the people. So let's understand the concept of acculturation. One of the earliest and most useful definitions of acculturation emphasized direct contact across ethnic groups and the fact that both the groups would undergo changes. Acculturation comprehends those phenomena which result when groups of individuals having different cultures come into continuous first-hand contact with subsequent changes in the original culture patterns of either or both the groups. A subsequent definition proposed the idea that there could be multiple causes for acculturation and that its effects could not be only varied but also observed and measured over varying amounts of time. Acculturation thus is cultural change that is initiated by the conjunction of two or more autonomous cultural systems. Acculturative changes may be the consequences of direct cultural transmissions or it may be derived from non-cultural causes such as ecological or demographic modifications induced by an impinging culture 
or it may also be delayed as with the internal adjustments following upon the acceptance of alien traits or patterns or it may be a reactive adaptation of trans transitional modes of life. Acculturation is a dynamic and multidimensional process of adaptation that occurs when distinct cultures come into sustained contact. It involves different degrees and instances of cultural learning and maintenance that are contingent upon individual, group and environmental factors. Acculturation is a dynamic because it is a continuous and fluctuating process and it is multidimensional because it transpires across numerous indices of psychosocial functioning and can result in multiple adaptation outcomes. So culture means that there are certain ways and reasons in which individuals and group of people, they speak to each other, conduct themselves, celebrate holidays and express their own belief systems. Acculturation thus refers to the modification of the culture of a group or individuals due to its interaction with another culture. Acculturation refers to the process where members of one cultural group adopt beliefs and behavioral patterns of the other cultural group. Acculturation refers to the changes that occur when different cultural groups come into the intensive contact. But more often than not, the term acculturation can be seen as an extensive cultural borrowing in the context of superordinate or subordinate or less powerful societies. The borrowing may sometimes be a two-way process, but generally it is the subordinate or less powerful society that borrows the most. So there are three steps in which acculturation takes place. The first one is the immersion, that is when an individual surrounds oneself entirely in a new culture. Assimilation, which involves the accumulation of information about a new culture and resulting adaptations to match that new culture. And finally, integration, which is often used in acculturation theory and includes participating socially in an environment to be considered an equal among the society. Now, the external pressure for culture change can take various forms. In its most direct form, conquest or colonization, the dominant group uses force or the threat of force to bring about the culture change in the other group. Let us study this with an example. In the Spanish conquest of Mexico, the conquerors forced meant native groups to accept Catholicism. Although such direct force is not always exerted in conquest situations, dominated people often have little choice but to change. Indirectly forced change abounds in the history of Native Americans in the United States. Although the federal governments made few direct attempts to force people to adopt the American culture, it did drive many native groups from their lands thereby obliging them to give up many aspects of their traditional ways of life. In order to survive, they had no choice but to adapt many of the dominant society's trait. When the Native American children were required to go to school, which taught the dominant society's values, the process was accelerated. A subordinated society may accumulate to a dominant society even in the absence of direct or indirect force. The dominated people may elect to adopt cultural elements from the dominant society in order to survive in their changed world. Or perceiving that members of the dominated society may identify with the dominant culture in the hope that by doing so they will be able to share some of its benefits. Say for example, in Arctic areas, many Inuit and Lap groups seemed eager to replace dog sleds with snowmobiles without any coercion. But many millions of people never had a chance to acculturate after contact with the Europeans. They simply died, sometimes directly at the hands of the conquerors, but probably more often as a result of the new diseases the Europeans inadvertently brought with them. Depopulation because of measles, smallpox and tuberculosis was particularly common in North and South America and on the islands of the Pacific.
those areas had previously been isolated from the contact with europeans and from the diseases of that continuous landmass we call the old world which includes the continents of europe asia and africa the story of ishi the last surviving member of the group of native americans in california called the yahi is moving testimonial to the frequently tragic effect of the contact with europeans in the space of the 22 years the yahi population was reduced from the several hundred to the near zero the historical record on this episode of depopulation suggests that the europeans americans murdered 30 to 50 yahi for every european american murdered nowadays many powerful nations and not just western ones may seem to be acting in more humanitarian ways to improve the life of previously subjugated as well as so let us look at an example we all know that people they move from one place to another in search of better job opportunities when a person leaves his native land they are called as migrant and when they come in contact with the people of the state or the country to which they move they also undergo some cultural change both the migrants as well as the natives they interact with each other and thus they adopt the new changes so this is called mutual adaptation and is an example of acculturation transculturation so what is transculturation it is a term which was coined by cuban anthropologist fernando ortiz in 1947 to describe the phenomenon of merging and converging cultures he proposed the term in contrast to the word acculturation which describes the process of transition from one culture to another on the part of an individual or a group transculturation is a process of cultural transformation marked by the influx of new cultural elements and the loss or alteration of the existing ones transculturation is what mike ball calls a traveling concept she argues that interdisciplinary in the humanities necessary exciting serious and must seek its heuristic and methodological basis in concepts rather than methods to look at the practice of cultural analysis bal suggest that a focus on concepts can better illuminate the object than a focus on methodologies she advocates a return to a close reading approach using concepts not so much as formally established univocal terms but as dynamic in themselves while groping to define provisionally and partly what a particular concept may mean we gain insight into what it can do it is in the groping that the valuable work lies the groping is a collective endeavor transculturation on the other hand refers to the encounter between or among cultures in which each one acquires or adapts elements of the other or in which new cultural elements are created ortiz found this a more appropriate term to describe the processes of cultural change at work in the creation of the cuban culture in the encounter between races he described five phases of transculturation from enslavement to compromise to adjustment to self assertion and to integration more generally the world transculturation can simply describe changes brought about in one culture by the introduction of elements from another he stressed the loss or displacement of a society's culture in this process together with the fusion of the indigenous and the foreign to create a new original cultural product Ortiz defined the concept in opposition to the term acculturation used by American anthropologist in 1936. The term transculturation better expresses the different phases in the transitive process from one culture to another because this process does not only imply the acquisition of culture as connoted by the Anglo-American term acculturation but it is also necessary involves the loss or uprooting of one's preceding culture what one could call a partial disculturation moreover it signifies 
the subsequent creation of new cultural phenomena that one could call neoculturation. For Ortiz, the transculturation was the creative potential of cultural encounters that embraced loss and recovery in new forms of cultural expression. One of the interesting features of Ortiz's paradigm was that it was not merely an uneasy fusion of two simultaneously held belief systems, but instead accounted for the historic specificity and artistic originality of new cultural phenomena going beyond the syncretic model of two cultural systems coexisting to embrace instead those elements retained and lost by the two systems in the creation of the third. For Ortiz, acculturation was a mechanistic process and it denied that culture was a dynamic, creative social fact. Transculturation, on the other hand, privileged the dialectical process itself rather than the resulting syncretisms. Ortiz's term emphasized the local, not the universal, in a new form of cultural dynamics that understands cultural Julie F. Codel 5 productivity, not in binary terms but as a fluid complex operation among differing and contesting cultural sites. Furthermore, this dynamic process, a powerful political potential that undermines hegemonic and homogenizing claims, the aim of which is the ultimate elimination of cultural differences. Transculturation was tied to the Cotodian, ordinary things and practices. Peruvian anthrographer and novelist Jose Maria further stressed the survival of an indigenous culture not affected by contact with the West but producing a Peruvian culture neither pure Indian nor pure Spanish but distinct from both. Mary Louise Pratt focuses on reception where transcultural works become legible or readable to the public. This readability springs from contact zones where cultures meet, clash and grapple with each other often in highly asymmetrical relations of domination and subordination like colonialism, slavery or their aftermaths. Such legibility relies on signifying practices that encode and legitimate the aspirations of these transculturally melded cultures. In the contact zone, subordinated or marginal groups select and invent from materials transmitted to them by a dominant or metropolitan culture to produce transcultural works in which colonized people write back to their colonizers and speak themselves, albeit on the colonizer's term. For Pratt, as for Ortiz, transculturation occurs when subjugated peoples determine what they absorb and how they use it. Identifying with the ideas, interests, histories and attitudes of others, comparing elite and vernacular cultural forms, engaging with suppressed aspects of multiple histories and rhetorics of authenticity, communicating across differences and hierarchy, and medi mediating among cultures. Patricia Archibald shares Parrot's view of a subordinate culture's appropriation and reinvention of itself in its own terms and through its own agency, giving the term a utopian inflection. Archibald compares transculturation to Wittgenstein's notion of language games where linguistic context and use replace linguistic origins so that use has a provisional but a fully de- resonated or decentralized relationship to origin, the way that people select, mix and transform culture in the era of transnationalism. Archibald seeks to obliterate the authority of cultural origin and focus on the provisional nature of transculturation. As Philip Hernandez in applying the term to Latin American architecture. For him, the term functions is a multi-directional and endless interactive process between various cultural systems in opposition to unidirectional and hierarchical structures determined by the principles of origin. Abril Trigo, examining the words 
changing uses among Latin American theorists notes that transculturation's popularity relies on the transience and perishability of its richly elusive meaning that may even anticipate postmodernism. For Trigo, the term implies the contingency of identity negotiated on a daily basis that permits the global revision of cultural structures. Transculturation has migrated into literature, film, communication, justice studies and across many ethnic and gender or transgender studies disciplines. Each use modifies the term as it also helps stabilize a set of ideas associated with transculturation across disciplines. In communication studies, transculturation has a utopian flavor as a term able to free us from the conventions and obsessions of culture itself because every culture requires interaction and dialogue with the other culture. Thus, transculturation, like Bhaktin's heteroglossic language, exists within all cultures like a multidimensional space and over time. But this utopian view in which individuals share and enrich each other through differences assumes equity among all mutually influential cultures, hardly the equilibrium that existed under colonialism or domination. David McDowell explores several meanings of transculturation in ethnographic and documentary films from crossing cultural boundaries with an awareness and meditation of the unfamiliar to more assertively denying such boundaries while recognizing the fragility of cultural differences. He argues that when we see ethnographic photographs, we see transculturally seeing differences and not similarities. McDowell deploys Clifford Reed's notion of culture as an historically transmitted system of inherited conceptions expressed in symbolic form by means of which men communicate, perpetuate and develop their knowledge about the attitudes towards life. In the 19th century, this often took visual forms that emphasized culture as appearance, race, dress, personal adornment, ceremonial forms, architecture, technology, and material goods. His views transcultural processes as injecting ambiguity into images and into disciplines underlying presumptions since image images range widely in their many possible meanings across different contexts. These authors share a view of transculturation as mutual and reciprocal exchanges across borders that are permeable and liminal, not restrictive spaces. They emphasize the processes of production and consumption as an antagonic plurality, the tense coexistence of diverse cultures in their segmented participation in dissimilar systems of productions. These processes generate ambiguity through the uneven reception of heterogeneous artworks that then produce discontinuities and create new cultural heterogeneities with modernity. The process may not necessarily be an act of compulsion where immigrants must con conform to the cultural practices of the new nation. However, it could be both preserving the indigenous culture and accepting the foreign culture simultaneously. At an individual level or in a group, people living in the same geographical area learn to absorb the beliefs, value systems and lifestyles of the other culture. Acculturation is generally observed to occur in cases of direct or first-hand contact between two cultures. It is a two-way process and both groups can get influenced in this. It does not necessarily mean drastic transformation in values, though values may gradually undergo a change. Children born in a foreign country with a culture different to their native culture tend to acquire the traits of a foreign culture from infancy. Now let us look into the historical perspective of acculturation. Acculturation can be seen as a gradual process of transformation that was initiated in the native Cherokee way of life. At the end of 18th century, accepting the proposal given by President George Washington, Cherokees changed themselves from the traditional hunting and gathering community to a cotton growing community. They started imitating the whites in their dressing style 
and they wanted to build homes similar to the whites and live a life like them. Missionaries helped the natives to acquire Christian beliefs and faith. Schools were started and Cherokees were eager to learn. The Cherokee syllabary was compiled in 1821 by the Sikoa. With the help of this, the New Testament was translated later by Elias. Further, the Cherokee nation adopted its constitution in 1827. Acculturation in Immigrants A huge number of Hispanics resides in the United States. The grandparents of the young Americans born in Hispanic families would have refused to acculturate, but it is not the case with their grandchildren. Changing attitudes towards getting good education or opportunities for higher studies, dreaming of a big career, earning a good salary, unlike the traditional attitude of working hard for a low pay or ignoring education for a quick job, or a generally satisfied with what I have attitude is nothing but a transformation due to the exchange of cultural aspects. Let us now study the topic of languages. English becoming the lingua franca of the world highlights acculturation. Hanzi or the logographic characters of the written Chinese language were adopted by Japan as kanji, in Korea as hanja and by the Vietnam. A European working in China may, after a considerable period of stay, learn to converse in Chinese and also encourage his or her colleagues to learn German or French, for instance. Another instance is that of the various versions of the Pidgin English, which is a mix of English and the local language. This developed primarily for the purpose of easy communication between the traders belonging to different cultures. The use of terms, the words or the phrases borrowed from the other languages also indicates that two or more cultures can be intertwined or linked as a necessity. Cuisine Urban areas or metropolitan cities in every country experience uniformity among its dwellers despite their diverse ethnic origins. Acculturation progresses gradually in terms of exchange of food items. Restaurants in cities serve different types of cuisines like Chinese, Mexican, Italian, East Asian, Indian, etc. Now this develops among people a taste for new delicacies. Peanut butter, for example, sandwich has become habitual for nearly all Americans irrespective of their ethnicity or native cuisine. Similarly, for a young teenager of Mexican origin, both a traditional recipe and a hamburger could be favorites. Also, people from cultural groups that are strictly vegetarian may try non-vegetarian foods after socializing with a different cultural group. Acculturation in India being the largest democracy of today's world, it may surprise many what makes a developing country like India sustain such a diverse population through a democracy. Acculturation could be the possible answer. India speaks hundreds of languages and not just dialects and states in India are divided on linguistic basis. Every state has a different cuisine, dressing style, language, housing pattern, traditions and festivals. Indian culture largely is a mix of various cultural influences like the British, Arabics, Islamic, Portuguese and the others. Acculturation here is reflected from the concept of Indian nationalism that exists and keeps such a group with diverse backgrounds bonded as a nation. Dressing pattern undergo a change rapidly, especially among the younger generation. Acculturating to a fashionable dressing style as a norm of a foreign land could be an example. Music is another important factor exhibiting acculturation. Music composers, singers or rock bands mix up sounds and rhythms from different places to compose a fusion. There can be several other facets of life that can be viewed as examples of acculturation across the countries. It could be a forced process like in case of refugees or the ancient slave trade. Cultural exchange programs held across different nations or even tourists adapting to a different lifestyle for fun can come under the umbrella of acculturation. So students, let us summarize this module with acculturative stress, which refers to the reaction to the process of intercultural contact or cultural adaptation.
It is the stress felt by the individuals while adapting to a foreign language, to a foreign cuisine, their behavioral patterns, beliefs, etc. Adaptation to the surrounding environment comes naturally to humans. Getting along with the new social environment is also something that has been happening throughout the human history of exploration, invasion, migration, trade, colonialism, and the more recent globalization. Acculturation is thus a similar sociological term that explains the process of people from different cultural backgrounds residing and settling together as one community. Thank you.